to my world Won't you come on in Hej, mit navn det er Stig Ulrichsen, og welcome to my world. I dag har jeg fået besøg af en gæst fra England. Helt præcis kommer han fra Manchester. Hans navn er Barry Whitram, og han er trommeslager i et legendarisk band, der har eksisteret i nogle 50 år efter hånden. Da de var i deres storhedstid, ja, der var der faktisk kun to bands, som de unge piger over alt i hele verden lyttede til. Det ene band, det var The Beatles, og det andet band var Herman's Hermits. Welcome, Barry. Nice to be here with you, Stig. It's great to see you again, and you are touring Denmark at the moment. And while you are touring Denmark, you stay in your second hometown almost. That's right. In Rannes, we love the place. You love to It's be here. It's a in great Rannes. city. Yeah? Yeah, love it. You have been coming in Rannes for many, many years. Oh, it must be 30, 40 years over the, over the year, you know, over our period here. Yeah, it's a long, uh, long time. Great city, though. What do you enjoy most by walking around in Rannas? Do you have some favorite places? We, uh, we used to go to uh, Barry's pub. <laughs> oh, it's uh, the name brother. <laughs> yeah, Barry's pub. And it's, the, the buildings are lovely. Lovely, nice churches. And uh, restaurants are nice. Uh, Polish bar, we used to go there. But, but, um, very, very nice city. It's not a city, it's a town, isn't it? Or is it? It's a city. It's a city, wow. actually, yeah. But still small. We are not that many people in Denmark. Did the concert go good? It was fantastic. We uh, we didn't realize it was in a car showroom. They cleared all the cars out in the morning, and it was so professionally set up. The stage was good. We've got a great sound uh, crew with us, and the audience were went ballistic. It was fantastic. We were singing along and screaming with us. <laughs> yeah, it was good. We do a, a 45 minute show. Then a 20-minute break, then we come back and do um, about an hour and uh, 10 minutes last night. Oh, it was a long night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you also have many hits to play, so you need to have some long sets. That's right, yeah. and uh, we're still learning some uh, some songs, hits we've never played before for 40 years. We're learning I Can Take a Leave Your Loving. It's a beautiful song. That we've never done it for years. And um, so that's uh, when we come back next year, that'll be on in the show. And a few others, but we uh, haven't done Hold On for a few years. Uh, that's a good song. That came from the, the film uh, Hold On, which we made in uh, Culver City in California. 1965, I think it was. <laughs> It's many years ago, <laughs> yeah. yeah. We have to talk a little bit about your films, but of course also all your recordings and your concerts. And maybe you also tell us a little anecdote from the back then where you traveled the world together with Hermans Hermes when you were young. Lad just finishing uh, <laughs> uh, being a hairdresser. I think you fin you had two years where you learned to uh, be a hairdresser. That That's right? right, Dad. I left school and uh, to, I went straight into a, an academy of hairdressing for a, my mother paid, I think it was a hundred guineas. And a, a guinea is actually a pound and a shilling in the old days. And it was a six month course, but the boss of the academy liked the way I was doing hair. And so he i stayed on for an extra three months for nothing because I was going to work for him in his big shops in, the, in Manchester. Uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen, so I went to a shop in a um, hairdressing salon in Eccles, and I was there about nine months, built up a great clientele. So it was a crash course. You know, usually it takes three years to become a, hair, a lady's hairdresser, passing pins and that. I don't want to pass pins. It was stuck, straight in, stuck in, perming, colouring. I got all the... Uh, the certificates behind my name and uh, enjoyed it then I was still working in a band and on a, in hairdressing you work late Thursday and Friday and start early Saturday that's when our shows were so I was, um, I had a scooter then a Lambretta I used to leave the shop at eight o'clock jump on my bike and drive to wherever the show was and somebody had already set me drums up rush in play a set and have a rest and play another set. It's getting too much for me. So I, I told me, uh, I asked my father, he says, can I pack in hairdressing and concentrate on the drums? Because I'm getting too tired doing the two jobs. So he said he'd think about it. And a week later he says, yes, you can concentrate on the drumming. You can pack your hairdressing in. But as long as you re practice eight hours a day, he said, when I go out to work, he said, 
uh, you start practicing and when I come home at six o'clock you stop you can have an hour off for your lunch I said I'll do it so I said I'll go and I'll tell my boss Monday morning I give him a month notice so uh, Monday morning came I went to see my boss and I said I want to give you a month notice I'm going to be a professional drummer he said you've got 10 minutes get all your stuff and clear off I was devastated. I was doing a great job for him. I was earning plenty of money for him. Ten minutes, I got my scooter. I was, I was absolutely fuming. I thought, this is not, not right, this. It was 20 years later, I was telling my father what happened. He only gave me ten minutes. And he says, you stupid boy. He said, when you wanted to pack in your hairdressing, he said, I went to see your boss. And I asked him if my uh, drumming didn't work out, could he have his job back? He says, of course he can, yeah. He says, he's earned a lot of money for me. Then my father said, well, when he comes in, just bring him down a peg or two and tell him he's got 10 minutes to clear off. It was my dad's idea. <laughs> <laughs> what a day. <laughs> yeah, he always, his sense of humour, my father. I never really realised it till years later. You know, that's where I think I get my practical joking from, inherited it from my dad. Yeah, then, um, but two years after I left the, the hairdressing salon, I had a diamond to something good, got to number one and we were doing big concerts and I had a big Jaguar car and a big yacht up in Windermere and I towed it back to Manchester but I stopped by his salon and I, <laughs> I knocked on the, uh, the door I said, can I see Mr. Colin, that was the boss's name, Mr. Colin, tell him Mr. Barrington, that was my official hairdressing name, Mr. Barrington is in the, the reception. So I waited and he came down after about nine minutes I said, sorry, Mr. Collin, I can't wait any longer. I'm on the double yellow lines here. I've been there 10 minutes. I'll see you. So he says, is that your car and boat? I says, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you, need to, you need to break off a little bit of one. Yeah, well, I thought I'd get me home back for giving me 10 minutes. It was years later when I saw him again, my boss in Manchester. I had to apologise for being such a big-headed young youth, you know, with a big car, a big yacht showing off. So I didn't realise it was my dad's idea to give me the no. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it couldn't be just a one night stand I asked to see her next week and she told me I could I asked to see her and she told me I could Something tells me I'm into something good Something tells me I'm into something Something tells me I'm into something Welcome to my world well, you always had a good support from your parents as a child uh, with the music because back then when you wished for drum kits, you know, uh, uh, it, it was very expensive. You know, I remember John Lennon saying that uh, drummers are rare to find in Liverpool because there are so few of them because it's such a big <laughs> yeah. investment to buy drums. Uh, yes. When you start interest, becoming interested in this uh, beat music, how did that start up for you? Well, I saw um, Elvis Presley, I think it was 1958 on the television doing JL House Rock and I couldn't believe the rhythm that that particular song had and the, the dancing. I thought that's that's for me, I'm going to be uh, a bit like Elvis or into music and some boys in our neighbourhood, we had a group but they didn't have a drum kit. They had a, a guy who could play tins and boxes 
And he said to me, if you get a drum kit, you can be in the band. So that was the reason why you started playing drums? Yes. I had the opportunity, the opportunity to get into a band. I couldn't play the drums. No, I had no idea, but I persuaded my mother to lend me 40 pounds, which is, you know, back in um, 59, whatever it was, the year, it was a lot of money. So anyway, I got 40 pounds. We went down to a friend of ours owned a music shop in Manchester in Oxford Street. That's where all the music shops were. And it's called Stock and Chapman's. And we went in there and I said, I've got 40 pounds. Can I have a drink and some cymbals? So she, um, what colour? I said, well, sort of uh, white would be right, a white kit. So she, well, they won't be all the same make. You'd have the different makes, but they were all sort of white. Anyway, I got five drums, different shades of white, and some cymbals, a couple of stands. And I went, set them up when I got home. But I set them up left-handed for some reason. Well, the reason was I saw a picture of Buddy Rich, the best drummer in the world, but the picture had been reversed. So I set my drum kit, I'll play it like he, he's the best drummer. It was about six months later, I was doing a gig, really struggling left-handed. And a friend of mine came up and said, you're right-handed, aren't you? I said, yeah. She said, why have you got your kit set, set up left-handed? I said, that's how Buddy Rich plays. <laughs> So he said, no, you put your snare drum over here, your hi-hat there, then you do that. And as soon as, oh, that's it. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Within weeks, and really improved. <laughs> did you have any, when you, they said, oh, we need a drummer, did you try out and say, oh, but I want to be a guitar player or whatever? You never had any thoughts about no, that? No, no, just the drums. I've got big hands. I've had trouble playing, putting things on the strings, so I can hold the big drumsticks. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it was, um, as soon as I got to put the, the kit up the right way around, it was um, uh, a lot easier. And I was just listening to records and copying what the, uh, all the rhythms. Then I heard the Beatles and I thought, Ringo Starr. I thought it was brilliant because he, on his bass room, he had the, sort of a doom, 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 boom, 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 that double beat. I, all American stuff I was listening to, it was always f uh, two to the bar or four to the bar. There's no doubling up on bass drum. Wow, that's good. So I eventually got the hang of that. <laughs> Some help up here. How about everybody clapping your hands together after four? One, two, three. Let me hear those hands. Fantastic. Okay, how about stamping your feet on the floor at the same time? Let me hear those feet. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay, here's the thing. We've got to keep this going 20 minutes. The boys are going down the road to the pool. Only kidding.
to my world. But as a child, you grew up uh, not as an only child, actually. You had a brother, but something terrible yes. happened in your childhood. I had a, an, an older brother. He was two years older than me, and uh, he was into music, and he was 14 years old. He, he uh, took a record player, you know, the old one with the lid on it, into the bath, next to the bath, and he was having a bath, reached over to change the, the turn the arm around, and it somehow he... It uh, shorted out and he got electrocuted in the bath. The, um, the reason I'm saying this is because we didn't have much money as a family and uh, when the opportunity came for me to try and get a drum kit, my mother said, you know, we've only got one, one son now, let's um, give him as much help as possible. So they lent me the money. I, I paid it back, £40. I was washing cars and milk rounds, paper rounds. <laughs> yeah, that's, it, must, it was sad, didn't it? It, was, it must have been a terrible tra tragedy for you all. It's something that takes a long time to get over, losing a brother yeah, it, it, and it, son. Yeah, it, it, I think it's, my mother never really got over it because she found her, my brother, in, in the bath. And I didn't know anything about it. I was, I'd gone to sleep. I was only uh, just about 12 at the time. Uh, I woke up and it was a different world. Everything had changed. Yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. You know, you were you were playing music in this band first, where they needed a, a drama. Was that the band you played in when uh, you later became Herman Hermit, or did uh, you change bands before that? It started off as the Demons. We were playing uh, instrumentals, you know, the Ventures, the Shadows, and doing Eddie. Anything with. Look, we didn't have a singer. Then uh, we we got a singer. Then it was Danny and the Demons, um, but little Danny. It was only about five foot, and back then we, the jazz scene was still pretty big. And we went to a, a place in it's called the Danum Hotel in Doncaster. It's in the winter; it was all snow. We were very late getting there. No time to sound check, and the microphones, because it was a jazz club, were hanging from the ceiling at a set height at about five foot nine for the trumpet players and the, so. So um, we went on, did a first number, an instrumental, and we introduced Danny, and he came running on, and the microphone, he was, he was about a foot short. <laughs> so we, he's trying to sing. <laughs> so we got a beer crate, put a beer crate down. He had to stand on a beer crate, and that was when it was Danny and the Demons. It was very funny. They wouldn't take us seriously because they were just laughing at the singer on a beer crate. <laughs> so then it became, he left, uh, he left because he wouldn't rehearse on Saturday afternoons because United were playing. <laughs> oh, what, what year are we in here? Uh... We're at about 1961. Uh, okay. Then we uh, we changed the name again to the uh, the Hellions. It was the same band without the Danny. We got another singer in. And uh, then we changed the name again to the Whalers. And there was Derek Leckenby, Ian Waller and myself, three-piece. And um, had a couple of things in that um, that didn't work out. And then we were playing at a, a club in Manchester called the Twisted Wheel. It was um, early '64, or not about January, February '64. And Harvey Lisberg, Herman and the Hermits manager, came to see us because we Derek knew him a little bit, and um, he said, I've, "I've got an offer for you." I said. I want you, the Whalers, to be the new Herman and the Hermits. So we said, we've seen Herman and the Hermits, we don't like him. The singer's very funny. Uh, was said, that Peter Noon? That or? was Peter Noon, yeah. Uh, what, what was funny about him? He just he had this big fang sticking out here. He's, he looked only about 15. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he said, not really, no. He said, well, have a look at the diaries for, for you chain, before you make your mind up. And he showed us all the dates that were working seven days a week for the, the next, you know, six months. So I said to Lek, Derek Lek, I've already turned professional. I need some of this money. This is great for six nights, seven nights a week. And uh, but that name, Herman and the Hermits, you've got to change that. Uh, you call it Herman's Hermits. If you call it Herman's Hermits, we'll join. Then um, a couple of weeks passed and Peter Noon, uh, and he's Herman and the Hermits had had a big, uh, what do you call it, a falling out in 
London at a studio while they were trying to make a record with Mickey Most. It didn't work out, so they, uh, they all broke up. Okay, so, so with the band that Peter Noon had at that time, how many were in that band? It was um, five of them. There were five already at that time? Yeah. It was, but it, they just didn't work out with It didn't them. work out, and Mickey Most had said to Harvey Lisberg, I'll record Peter Noon, but you need a better band. So um, then that's when Harvey came to us and said, you, know, you want to be the new Herman and the Hermits? Not really. So um, in the meantime, Peter Noon, Carl Green and Keith Hartwood from the original Herman and the Hermits became friends again. So there's only a, a place for a drummer and a bass player. So Lex said he's not playing bass, he'd go on lead guitar, because he was a lead guitarist. Somebody out of the Carl Green or Keith Hartwood would have to play bass. So Carl Green went on bass and uh, we had a, a couple of rehearsals with him, it sounded great, the new band. And they, they changed the name from Herman and the Hermits to Herman's Hermits. And you didn't know those fellows before, you have no. never met them before? No, really. only you just, just heard seen, them, seen them once. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> they also grew up in Manchester, right? Yeah, and they, I lived on the south side and uh, Peter Noon, Carl Green, Keith Hotwood lived on uh, the north side. It's just sort of northwest anyway, out but, there. But at that time when they asked you to join the band, were they recording anything at that time? Had they recorded anything before you joined the band or were they just starting up on it? They tried to make a record, it not worked out. And, but they'd done TV shows in Manchester and I'd seen them. A local TV show? Yeah, they, they did uh, uh, something called Mashed Potato and they were kicking the legs. I thought, what's all this? <laughs> <laughs> That's before we, we got, um, Harvey Elizabeth made the offer. But when we joined, we didn't, uh, we said, we're not kicking our legs up, just play the music and sing. And it, um, it worked, but we had to pass an audition first because Harvey Lisberg had a, a partner called Charlie Silverman and Charlie Silverman not seen us and Harvey said you well we'll just go up and to his cellar city gear and just have a few numbers and so Charlie can see her so we went up to his house set up our gear in his cellar and Harvey Lisbeth and Charlie Silverman were sat in the chairs looking at us and we, we we played about five numbers and we could tell they weren't impressed and especially Charlie Silverman and Harvey said, we're going upstairs for a cup of tea and have a bit of a chat. We'll come down in about 10 minutes. So as soon as he went upstairs, I said to Lech, They're going to, we're going to get the, the elbow. You know, the elbow means you're not going to get the job. You're going to get fired before you start. So we've got to impress them. So then the, Harvey and Charlie were Jewish boys. And we used to do a great song called Haven de Gila. And it started very slow on the guitar. Down, down. And we used to, it's about three minutes long, but by the time we finished, it was ding, 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 ding. <laughs> I said, as soon as he could put the foot through that door, don't give him a chance to fire us, start playing up in the gear. So we, they came through the door, ding, 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 ding. By the time we finished, they were dancing around. <laughs> we dancing. I said, play it again, play it again, we played it again. And we got the job, <laughs> thanks to having the gear. <laughs> Silly how life turns out, isn't it? I told her that I was a flop with chicks I've been this way since 1956 She looked at my palm and she made a magic sign She said what she needed Love potion her and I She bent down, turned around, gave me a wink She said I'm gonna mix it up right here in the sink Welcome to my world. But uh, then you became Herman's Hermits. What year was that in? 1964, the band officially formed uh, April the 1st, 1964. And uh, we were taken up to a tailor 
if you, a Jewish, everything was Jewish, went to Harvey and Charlie, a Jewish tailor, to get some suits made up so we could have some proper, proper photographs taken. So this tailor, he, he went up to Peter Noon, he says, what do you do? He says, I sing. He says, pretend you're singing. And he says, like that, no, you have a microphone. He said, Hold the microphone. And he measured his suit and he measured him holding a microphone like that. So I thought, this is not the way it should be. Then the guitarist, he measured them, like that sleeve, that suit. So when, when they put the sleeves, when they had the suits, actually one sleeve was longer than the other. And he says to me, what do you do? I said, I play the drums. You sit down. I said, yeah, well, sit down. I'll measure your trousers sat down. <laughs> we didn't know any better. So um, the suits were made and um, we arrived at the <laughs> photography studio. We're all lined up there and the photographer said, you and the end one. I said, me? He says, yes, you. He said, stand up straight. I said, I'm standing up straight. He says, your legs are bent. I said, that's not me. It's the trousers. <laughs> 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 well, they didn't last long with suits because the fan. I, I guess Peter Noon's hand was disappearing when he was laying up straight in the, in the sleeve. Like <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the great. suits didn't last long because the, we used to get mobbed then and the fans would rip the suits. <laughs> then we got more made, but we're not just standing up straight. <laughs> oh, we didn't know any better about that. No. Paul, let's have the banjo sound. Big hit in Norway, you can all sing along if you like. I know you can sing. All ready? Are we all ready? Yes, we are. Mrs. Brown, you've got to say lovely. Girls as sharp as her or something red. Because it was two bands, so you know, you and and uh, Derek came from one band, and the other guys were in, in in their own band. Did you get along right away when you yeah, we did. met each other? Had a good uh, what do you call it? It was good cause, chemistry between you. Yeah, it was good because the music was better, and everyone was enjoying it. And uh, we were earning more money, and we were working seven nights a week. What, what kind of music did you do in the beginning? Was well, that cover songs? From covers, American or? stuff. Yeah, mainly American covers. Um, and some uh, Liverpool stuff, and uh, didn't do any of the Rolling Stones. They did a couple of Beatles, sort of not the hits, but the the album tracks. Barry, thank you very much for giving yourself time to come into our little studio here and talk about your life with Herman's Hermits. It's been my pleasure, really. Has. Thank you. Og dermed er nået frem til vejs inden af Welcome to My World i denne her uge. Jeg håber at se jer alle sammen igen i næste uge. Tak fordi I kiggede med. Welcome to my world